Well, thank you. Appreciate everybody joining on uh, another beautiful Saturday. At least it's beautiful here. We were out walking the dogs and it's a little breezy, but it's a, a nice day. And uh, we're going to be turning our directions towards uh, the San Antonio. And we have uh, Christopher Medina, who's going to be our guest speaker. Carol and I were in San Antonio about three years ago, and we had the uh, great fortune to link up with uh, Chris, and he gave us a wonderful tour of the uh, Hemisphere Park. Uh, he's got a great website, and make sure uh, you go and visit it after the, the talk, and uh, done a really great job in uh, immortalizing and uh, capturing the history of, uh, of it. Let me move you over here to co-host Chris, so you can start sharing in a moment. Okay. And I'm going to throw everybody else on mute. And uh, Chris can, uh, you should be unmuted. But uh, yeah, take it away, Chris. Appreciate your joining us today. All right. Well, hello, everyone. And thank you, Bill, for allowing me to uh, participate and to share with everyone my uh, hemisphere journey. Um, I myself did not actually attend the fair. I'm originally from Wisconsin, and I jokingly tell people, well, I missed Hemisphere by about 10 years in half a dozen states. Um, my interest in Hemisphere really didn't start uh, the way it progressed. It started out in 2006, uh, where I had bought a few items for a shelf. They thought, oh, this would be cool. You can't put a tower, so you know, souvenir your books. I thought that'd be fun. Um, but as I got started, collecting, I started re reading more into each item I acquired, and it started each piece told its own story, but when I put it side by side with something else, it started telling a bigger story, and after a while, I kind of got hooked on the history of World's Fairs, uh, and particularly the uh, San Antonio's hosting for 1968, and I'll get my, oops, share sound, optimize for a video clip, and I'll just start with that. And so I put this little uh, presentation together to kind of go through my own journey with Hemisphere, but also with, uh, there it is, um, with all the items I've collected also do with the story of Hemisphere, since it was kind of one of the lesser known world's fairs. So I thought I'd start with a little bit of trivia for everyone. Um, obviously, it was located in the heart of downtown San Antonio. Um, the overall urban renewal project was about 143 acres, but the fair itself comprised about 92.6 acres. The uh, theme of our World's Fair was Confluence of Civilizations in the Americas, and the idea for that theme was to celebrate all the various ethnic groups, not only the indigenous ones, but the ones that came from around the world to settle what is now known as South Central Texas. Um, we were officially, uh, we were an official World's Fair. We were sanctioned by the BIE in November, 1965. The following month, um, our US State Department sent out a Hemisphere Proclamation and the official letter of invitation to the approximately, I think it was 115 nations that the United States had official embassies with at the time to participate in our World's Fair. The fair itself was a universal World's Fair, so it was a six month uh, run and we ran from April 6th through October 6th of 1968. Um, I, when I understand, like I know the New York World's Fair in 64 coincided with their 300th birthday. Well, with ours, it coincided with our 250th birthday of the city's founding back in 1718. We were projecting about 7.2 million visitors to come to the fair, and I believe that was the break-even point financially, but unfortunately, we fell short, and in the end, we only had about 6.4 million visitors from around the world. Um, as I said, we invited all 100 and some odd, I think 115 nations to participate. In the end, we had about 33 and about 15 U.S. corporate pavilions for visitors to, to uh, visit. Um, just to share, this was actually the very first item I ever acquired. And like I said, at the time, um, the thought was, oh, this is cool. This will look nice on a, on a bookshelf in my office. I think this would be neat. But like I said, it, you know, it starts telling its own story and I got hooked after a little while. 
um, after I started learning about San Antonio, oh, it was a World's Fair. Okay. Well, I started getting more interested to find out about what is a World's Fair and have other cities hold to just what is this? Um, and this is back around 2007. And, um, oops, I don't know. And so let's see here. There it goes. Um, these were websites I found online that, that were dedicated to specific expositions. Um, so I, that's where I got me more interested. Oh, okay, so Seattle had one. So that's what their Space Needle was about. Um, I had never even heard of Spokane, Washington, but I thought that was interesting that they had hosted one. And of course, I was somewhat familiar uh, through the Men in Black films um, about the New York, New York 64, 65 World's Fair. And I knew a little bit about 67 as my mother and her family actually went there because like, like I said, we're from Wisconsin originally. So during summer of 67, my grandparents and my mom and my aunt in their car and they went up to Canada and got to see the expo. Um, and of course I came across, this is how I first uh, learned about Bill Cotter was through his websites, uh, worldsfairphotos.com I'm showing here, uh, as well as uh, World's Fair Community to learn more about it. And I thought, wow, this is great. This is, has a lot of great information to fill in what is a World's Fair, what other city, cities have hosted it. But um, one thing I was a little bummed out about was the fact that when I was trying to learn more about San Antonio in our World's Fairs, so like in, like I said, uh, 2006, 2007, there really wasn't much out there. It, it, you know, maybe the Tower of the Americas, the Institute of Texas and Cultures, home pages, mm -hmm. and some Yelp reviews, that was about it. Um, and at the suggestion of a friend, he says, well, why not be the first trip? Why not put a, start with a little web page or something? And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm learning more about it. It'll be fun. I've never programmed a website before. But uh, so that's how that kind of started. And so from 2008 to 10, I pretty much, you know, started with a little three by five index card. And next thing I have pages upon pages of outlines and ideas that can find more and more items. Because like, oh, this would be great on this web page. This would be great on that page. Um, and then in 2010, 2011, I spent one year building it out. And in, in April the 6th of 2011, I actually launched my own website. Um, here on the left, you see what was, I guess, called uh, version 1.0. This was actually hand programmed. So that was a lot of fun learning HTML. Um, but this was the site I actually had up on the internet from April of 2011 through April of 2021. Um, by that time, this site had started aging, links started breaking, things like that. So as opposed to trying to go back and, you know, band-aid every little thing, I actually went out and through another friend's assistance, used WordPress, which is very common now, and actually built this website. This is actually 2.0. Still uses the same web address, which you can find me at uh, worldsfair68.info and or worldsfair68.com. Um, neat thing about the new site is that it's more adaptive. So if you're on a PC, a laptop, or even an iPad, Android, or iPhone, it, it'll adapt. And you can see I even include a little search engine for visitors to ask questions. It's like, well, what, what does Chris have on the U.S. Pavilion uh, construction you know, or something like that? You know, you can ask the website. So it's a little intuitive that way. Um, also, in my research, I've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of folks here in San Antonio that were part of the World's Fair, you know, folks that visited the fair, um, those that worked for the Fair Corporation. The uh, gentleman on the right here, um, excuse me, on your left, is William R. Sinkin. He was the very first president of San Antonio Fair, which was the uh, governmental entity, uh, private entity created to put on the World's Fair. He served for a year and then stepped down, became the honorary co-chairperson. Uh, it was with him and his friend, uh, Henry B. Gonzalez, who was the first Hispanic in San Antonio, uh, elected to Congress. And he's the one that came up with the idea of what he coined a 20th century plan for the 20th Congressional District, which included a type of fair type event, which eventually led into the San Antonio World's Fair. The gentleman on the right is the late Tom Frost. He served as, he was the, uh, his family is Frost Bank here in town in Texas. Um, they were one of the 26 clearinghouse banks 
But at the time, Mr. Frost served as the vice president of international relations. So because he had a lot of great contacts through Latin America, Mexico, and some in Europe for, through his uh, banking ventures. Um, so he had a lot of great things to tell, even back to where um, they, a lot of executives opened up their homes to accommodate people that weren't at the fair. They had one young hostess from the French pavilion that stayed in their spare uh, uh, guest bedroom for the whole six month run of Hemisphere. Um, this great lady is uh, Robin Riquet. She was one of the 40 some odd official VIP tour guides for the World's Fair. So many, about a year before the fair opened, she had to go through about a six month training course where they had learned everything, the general trivia about the United States, Texas, San Antonio, uh, every pavilion, every participant, every food venue, because one of their many jobs was for when VIPs and dignitaries or people that wanted private tours, they would get one of her, from her team and they would show them around the site. Uh, this gentleman, is his name is Eric Martin. He's actually my employer's uh, brother, and he actually worked at the fair. He started out at, as an entertainer at the uh, Golden Garter Club, and then, I'm sorry, the Gay 90 Saloon, then he went over to the Go Golden Garter Club. Um, so he had a lot of great stories to tell about the entertainers that came to the Hammond's Fair. As with most World's Fairs, it always starts with a general question. Can we host a World's Fair? So in 1963, the executive committee reached out to Economic Research and Associates out of Los Angeles. So he said, okay, we understand you were the firm that did the feasibility study for the city of Seattle in the late 1950s uh, for their World's Fair. So we would like to contract you to run the same question using the same parameters as you gave for the city of Seattle to see if we can do it for our 250th birthday in 1968. And this is actually the cover of the of an original print I have in the collection, uh, which the answer came back, yes, you can. So this is just, uh, here's one page where they kind of broke down saying you'll get about 30% of visitors from San Antonio or two hours out, uh, another 28% from those that live within Texas, but within six hours away. Um, and then you have pretty much everyone else. Let's see, 3% uh, from the rest of Texas and about 40% that came out from the rest of the United States and the world. They um, did say that the annual um, spending per person would be a little bit less than those in Seattle because Seattle has a higher cost of living than we do still today. But they did say that the what would make up for that would be the fact that we have a larger population base. But at the time for 1963, they said that the average person visiting the San Antonio World's Fair in 1968 would spend an average of $5.03, which would include admission. Once we got official accreditation and more of the ideas became more solid, the next step was to design the World's Fair. So what we have here on the left is actually one of the newer acquisitions into my collection it is a uh, original blue line print set of some of the site plans. Uh, this is from 1966, I believe, um, where you actually see all the, all, all the layouts. The um, fair had its own architectural and planning office. Um, it, has, it was overseen by a gentleman named Allison Peary and his wife, Mimi. And then they had a chief architect named uh, John Cricken, and he was the one that actually worked on the original plans that in this case, you can see here, these were filed to the city of San Antonio for engineering approval. Um, here on the right, these are drawings I don't have in the collection, but I was fortunate to visit a local architectural firm. Uh, back then, they were known as Phelps and Simmons, and they actually were the architect architectural firm on record to uh, design the GE Pavilion, our original convention center complex, and the, the quarter mile river walk extension, which led from the National Channel into the convention center complex. Let's see here. This one here is a press image. It's from the, the official fair offices, which were uh, located right across the street. Uh, here you have one gentleman, he's one of the uh, fair executives giving you a tour, showing them the uh, 
scale model of the site. Here you can see the Tower of the Americas in its final form. Um, many people may not be aware that for our Tower of the Americas, which is our theme structure for the World's Fair, this is actually, what we see today was actually design number four on paper because they kept designing it and then the bids kept coming in way high. And eventually this one came in at about $4.25 million or for 1967 uh, value anyway. Um, another part of the planning was the graphics design of the standards. This is another book I have in the, my collection. Uh, and here it talks about the, uh, the um, guidelines for using the fair logo in, in fonts, different colors to use. Um, I believe back then Helvetica was the popular font at the time, which was more of a clean line mid-century modern style. So you can see that throughout the book. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, San Antonio was San Antonio Fair was accredited as an official World's Fair. So obviously we had to keep filing reports with the BIE in Paris to show not only compliance with all BIE requirements. Um, but to show progression and also to show that we'd be able to uh, operate the fair and complete construction on time for the opening in 1968. Here are a few uh, press images I've acquired over the years. Um, this one is the early stage. This is from late 1967, showing the early stage construction of our theme structure, the Top of the Americas. Um, it had a lot of similarities compared to the Space Needle, uh, for the 62 World's Fair, A, it was, a, it was an observation tower set up as a theme structure. Uh, we both had a main observation level. We both had featured a, a rotating restaurant, which go about one rotation per hour. Um, the primary difference was in the architectural styling of it. Um, the Seattle Space Needle was more of a, a, a futuristic, futuristic Jetson style tripod using steel where ours is more of a mid-century modern style, I believe they refer to as a brutalistic style, which uses the raw concrete. Um, the neat thing about this, the design of the shaft is that no one surface will be exposed because of all the different shapes, different angles, no one surface will be exposed to direct sunlight at any one time, which reduces the, the wear and tear on the, uh, on the structure. Um, here is a, construction image from early 1968. Uh, you can see in the background on the right, you have the iconic United States Pavilion Confluence Theater with, with its exhibit hall, of the square building in the mid section. Um, the street here originally was one of the original streets for the neighborhood called Goliath Street. Um, so they kept that road, that uh, pathway access for the fair. So I kind of refer to this as the Goliath access. Um, and then on the left, you can kind of make out the Swiss sky ride. And of course, in the foreground, you have our main monorail. This is another uh, construction image. The uh, gentleman on the left is our then mayor of San Antonio, Mayor Walter McAllister. Uh, the young lady uh, next to him, she was actually a fair uh, staffer. And she was actually modeling that day for um, possible uniform ideas for the uh, Lagoon Cruise at Hemisphere. Uh, one of the interviews I had was with a lady named Sherry Wagner, and she told me about this image. She says, well, this is in uh, late 1967, and they said, hey, Sherry, by the way, uh, we never figured out about uniforms for the Lagoon Cruise. So she actually kind of went out to Joskies and to J.C. Penney's and picked out a few different um, samples, and then she went, went across the street to the fair site with her colleague here, and so her colleague here is actually modeling one of the ideas that she came up with. I don't believe that's what they use in the end, but it's kind of a neat story. And while they were walking around, she said, hey, we bumped into Mayor Max. So he was uh, kind enough to pose for a photograph with us. Here's another uh, construction image. This one is a finishing out image for the IBM Durango Pavilion uh, for the World's Fair. Uh, IBM actually had two pavilions. Uh, this one was. Uh, IBM Durango. The other one was known as IBM Lakeside. But in this one, it featured a unique um, system. You can see they're rolling in at what is known as a jacquard loom. And they actually rigged it up to a series of computers that visitors could use a then state of the art stylus, um, kind of like those banking pens used in the credit card machines. It's a stylus attached to a cord. But in this case, it's a lot fatter. 
um, and they would design they would design little images in a little sample, and then they would send it to the, to the system, and the system would uh, instruct the Jacquard loom to make a small lanyard based on whatever they did, whatever uh, shape they scribbled doodled on their computer screen. This here was one of the more unique uh, construction projects offsite. Um, at the time, San Antonio was not known as an international tourism destination, which was part of the idea for hosting a World's Fair. Uh, so we needed new hotels. Um, in this case, this one is an image for Zachary Construction, which actually built the Palacio de Real Hotel. Um, unique design about this, it's kind of reminiscent of the apartments for Expo 67 where you use modular construction. Um, this was because A, they had very limited room on the site, and two, standard construction could not be finished in time, but only that of a modular construction could, could make it possible to meet the April 6th deadline. Uh, there are 500 room modules, like I said, they were all built off-site, trucked to the site and hoisted into place. Um, the project actually got itself into the Guinness Book of World Records for fastest built modular construction. It was about 202 days from when they broke ground officially to when Zachary gave the keys to the general manager saying, here we go. That was about a few days just before the fair opened. When it came to promoting the fair, they had a lot of great ideas. Um, Mandy or Randy may find this one interesting. This is actually a copy I have in my collection of the American Airlines in-flight magazine. Um, where the, and there's actually about a six page insert talking about the World's Fair in different pavilions. Now, if I can do this right, I need to switch screens because I wanted to show you a commercial, which is a little promotional video from the IBM company. See if I can do this right. And did I do one second? Yes, share sound. Okay. Share, me expand that. And here we go. The girls at Hemisphere in San Antonio are observing Secretary's Week with more fascinating lunch and coffee breaks than their compatriots. Sites like the circular US Pavilion tempt them, but office business comes first as the girls keep up with the mass of correspondence at this official World Fair. Everything's up to date at the fair, from the unusual moving graphic displays at the German pavilion to the latest advances in electronic equipment. There's less work for the secretary, as IBM's magnetic tape selectric typewriter automatically types error-free copy at speeds of up to 150 words per minute. Secretaries can marvel at the intricate clock-like precision of the Swiss mechanical bird, or spend their free time pavilion hopping at south of the border exhibits. Even work is almost play with modern dictation equipment that boosts the efficiency of Gal Fridays and executives alike. What's it like working and playing at Hemisphere 68? All the secretaries agree, it's a breeze. Let's see, now I want to go back to my PowerPoint. So let's see here. Oh, and I need to, I guess, restart it one moment. Okay. Yeah, my computer's not wanting to respond, right? That's correct. Seven. Your screen sharing. Yeah, I think you need to. Uh, oh, there you are. There you yeah. go. Sorry. <laughs> A little no sluggish to respond going from Texas to California and back again, I guess. <laughs> All righty. Um, here's a copy in my collection of an internal uh, publication magazine for Eastman Kodak that they distributed to a lot of national dealers and distributors uh, promoting the World's Fair. I like this shot because you can see it's from the uh, Don't Star Brewing Pavilion uh, upstairs level. Uh, access and you got the iconic Tower of the Americas in the background. Um, and then here's another one. This is actually a one page insert. I'm not sure what magazine it came out of, but you can see it was for uh, Continental Airlines um, for their advertising, advertisements um, for the World's Fair. Um, and I know in my research, I know American, Continental, Braniff, and Eastern 
uh, created special uh, flights that ran from different parts of the country into San Antonio um, as jet travel was becoming then popular. Um, neat thing for us in San Antonio was that our, at our airport before the World's Fair, um, most plane, planes either would be oh, uh, turboprops or even commercial jets like the 70, the 73, uh, 727, um, they would taxi up to the building, they would roll upstairs and you had to get off. But uh, to accommodate visitors that were coming by plane, we went through a bond issue to update our airport to include jet bridges. So for us, that was a that was something new for us. And we've had them ever since, but that was a, you know, like I said, it was a neat novelty uh, for San Antonio. This is one of the few other ins page inserts I have from that. I thought I'd share this one because it's, it's actually an image uh, from Expo 67 in Montreal. Um, and basically it says, now that Expo's over, the competition has a word or two to say about that. Great, because now they're saying, okay, great, we're, we're next in line um, for the official World Expo. And we actually had a handful of folks, uh, food contractors, for example, as well as entertainers, that, that were part of Expo 67, and then just packed up and came down to San Antonio and participated in our World's Fair in 1968. Um, as far as, the, as another idea for planning and promotion was that the Fair Corporation, it, starting in 64, started releasing an internal magazine. Uh, it was full of ideas, promises, and progress reports on what's going on. Um, you can see here where it talks about how these local leaders were start going to uh, Washington, D.C. to get federal participation. Obviously, like I said, this is 64. This is about a year before we got official accreditation by the BIE. Um, but this is where we start to court to get ideas to get um, the, the, I can't name, think of the name, but there was actually a subcommittee, I, I think it was through the Commerce Department, subcommittee on fairs and expositions, uh, which you know, handled you know, participation in Seattle, uh, New York City, uh, and then us uh, at the federal level. Um, this is actually a copy of an insert I acquired a few years ago. This one's actually from the New York Times. Um, I have a few from them. I have a few from Houston and one from Los Angeles, um, where they actually was included as an insert in the Sunday paper as other ways to promote uh, the San Antonio World's Fair. And then we finally had our opening day. This was on Saturday, April the 6th of 1968. Uh, our gates opened at about 9 a.m. The official opening day ceremonies uh, kicked off about an hour later at 10 a.m. in the arena, which is the little small round structure you can see uh, in the newspaper there, just the, to the left of the Tower of the Americas. Um, obviously, we, you, we had a lot of great souvenirs. This is actually an original print of the uh, souvenir guidebook, which obviously covered all the pavilions, places to eat, maps, mm -hmm. history of different houses. Um, this is where I actually learned that one of the homes which is actually still on site today. According to this guidebook, the deed history goes back to the Baron, to where the King of Spain granted a, a land grant to Baron de Bastrop in 1721, which is about three years after our founding in 1718. When visitors, visitors came through the gates, we had about five of them, which were open from uh, 9 a.m. through midnight. Um, they were also given these little hand uh, brochures, uh, of program guides, and it talked about all the different uh, entertainment, special entertainment events, what time certain attractions opened, um, in which case, the few I, I acquired, including this one, actually have our autograph. Uh, it may or may not be able to read, but this one is actually autographed by Roy Rogers, Dale Evans, and then Roy, Roy's horse trigger. As with most World's Fairs, what I've learned is that it's usually the honor of the leader of that nation to travel to the site to open the World's Fair. Uh, from what I understand, Nixon was on hand to open up Expo 74 in Spokane. Uh, Kennedy, from what I understand, didn't do it in person, but he did it by phone from the White House to do the official opening ceremony uh, for the Seattle World's Fair two years before, uh, six years before us. At any rate, so the original plan was for then President Lyndon Johnson to be on hand 
Um, but due to the unfortunate events of the tragic assassination of MLK two days earlier, he felt it was best to not leave Washington. So he sent Lady Bird Johnson in his place. Um, this image here, this is actually uh, an image of her doing her opening day speech from inside the arena. This other image, you see Lady Bird Johnson lady that morning, the gentleman on her uh, right is then governor John of Texas, John Connolly, who is actually also the commissioner general of Hemisphere 68. And the lady next to her is uh, First Lady of Texas, Nellie Connolly. Um, both of these images were actually uh, from the official White House collection and taken by uh, one of the White House photographers by the name of Robert Kirsten. Uh, with most World's Fairs, you can either go and buy your books there on site or you can go through uh, retail stores, what have you. Um, before you go to the fair, you can buy your bonus books. Basically, we had all the coupons in there already. You can buy them at a little bit reduced value compared to actually buying them there on site. Um, so this is one of the few I have in my collection. And um, in this one, I, I thought I'd show you that this was the uh, admission ticket for the mini monorail. It went around the fair site, had about three stops, and it was nice and elevated. So you actually catch the breezes. You could look down and see which attractions had the, the short lines to get off the next stop and double back. And then also, this one is also for the uh, the, tower, the original admission tickets for the Tower of the Americas. Um, obviously, I haven't really tried the idea of taking it to the Tower today to see if they would still honor it. I don't think so, but <laughs> that'd just be my, my, my theory I want to try out sometime. Let's see. The next couple of slides I have for you are about the national pavilions of the various nations that participated. Like I said, we had approximately uh, 33 nations from around the world. This one is actually a press image of the hostesses in front of the uh, Mexico Pavilion. This one is actually one of the hostesses and the security staff for the Belgian Pavilion. Um, this actually isn't a press image. This is actually a private image I got from the, the security gentleman on the far left. He's kind of looking at the camera, smiling. Um, he actually reached out to me a few years ago and said, hey, I was one of the security personnel for the Belgian Pavilion. I'd like to share some of these images. Um, he actually stayed at Fort Sam, and he said that he actually got yelled at after this image was taken. He said, dude, you're not supposed to be smiling. Only the ladies were. But uh, he said it was a fun time. He had a lot of, a lot of great time. He worked for the entire six months um, and enjoyed meeting, other, you know, meeting people from other, other countries as well. Um, these couple of images are from a, a series of Kodachrome slides I acquired a few years ago. And I try to go around the same path that Bill does as far as you know, running them from a, through a scanner and then trying to manipulate. Um, so, but this is, these are kind of my best um, tricks for that. Um, this was obviously in front of the uh, Columbia Pavilion, one of the Latin American pavilions we had. This one is obviously the front of the Italian Pavilion. And unfortunately, both of these pavilions were demolished after the fair closed. So they actually demolished a lot of the buildings um, in the western end of the, of the uh, property, which included these pavilions. This one is of the National Pavilion for Japan. And this one is actually of Portugal. Uh, I wanted to share this image because the statue of San Antonio de Padua there in the foreground is actually still with us today. It's actually on river level. So people you know, are walking around on the river walk. You actually can go walk past that. It has a nice little uh, base for it. Um, but it was one of the neat art features that was commissioned for the fair. It was given to us afterwards. And you can still enjoy it when you visit San Antonio today. Here are images of scans of the front pages of some of the many um, national pavilion brochures I've acquired over the years. This one is from the uh, Belgian pavilion. And then here we have the Japanese pavilion. And the neat thing about this one is there's a stamp on that. And what I've learned, um, it was a passport stamp. And, and I think that what I've learned that started in Expo 67, where people can get like a makeshift souvenir passport book. And they can go around to different pavilions and get it stamped. We picked that up. And from what I understand, it's still a unique tradition 
at World's Fairs today. Obviously, we have uh, Korea, the Spanish Pavilion. This is from the Germany. And then I brought one in from the United States Pavilion as well. Next, I'll go ahead and switch on over to corporate pavilions. This is a uh, print, black and white press image of the GE Pavilion. This is the one I actually showed you earlier where I actually had the pleasure of seeing the original floor plans, uh, the design plans uh, for this building. Um, and then unfortunately, this is one of the many pavilions that was you know, demolished after the fair uh, so they could finish out some road projects. But I think it was a, a beautiful design. It's more, again, mid-century modern, you know, very clean, sleek uh, lines. This one is of, the, of uh, interactive, well, not really interactive, but cubes you could, you know, see. This is from the RCA Pavilion, which was Kitty Corner uh, from the United States Pavilion you can see in the background. Um, and it's interesting because this pavilion was actually designed by a local architect named Norcell Haywood, who is actually one of the first uh, African-American architects to graduate from UT Austin uh, in the early 1960s. And I believe at the time he was working for a local firm named Ford, Ford Powell and Carson. Um, so this was actually one of his, his buildings and it, one of the few that's actually still around today for, uh, from his architectural style. Here's another Kodachrome. This is of the, you see it's of the uh, Coca-Cola Pavilion. You can see the Swiss Skyride and the Tower of the Americas in the background. Um, the neat thing about this pavilion was that it was one of the two sites that had a puppet show commissioned for uh, by uh, Sid and Marty Croft. And it was called the Kaleidoscope Puppets, as you can see there. But there were two characters from this show that one was named Luther, and I forgot the lady's name, but after the fair closed, they held on to those characters and they were revamped. Luther was revamped into H.R. Puff and stuff, and the other character was revamped into Wichifu, which became part of the prominent show uh, H.R. Puff and stuff in the 1970s. But so, and I believe I mentioned at the bill when he was there, he said, yeah, you see this round foundation? This is actually the birthplace of H.R. Puff and stuff. Um, here we have, it's a little shaded, but this is actually a, a photo of the Eastman Kodak Pavilion at Hemisphere. Uh, uh, Eastman Kodak was actually one of the first three companies to um, participate in the World's Fair. And their building was actually meant to be a temporary, but it's actually still around today. Um, why they have to not to demolish it, I don't know. I'm eternally grateful because it's, it's a beautiful building. Again, simple, clean line, mid-century modern style. Um, and it's actually bolted onto the building next door, which is the Women's Pavilion, which actually was built as a um, permanent building. So why I never demolished it, I'm eternally grateful for that. I, I love, I park nearby there and I love looking at it every time I go down there. Uh, I get stuck. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, here we have a uh, black and white image of the Ford Motor Pavilion. Um, with Ford and GM, they actually got uh, two local dealerships here in town to sponsor vehicles. So for the first three months of the fair, uh, these dealerships actually brought out vehicles from their showrooms to promote, as well as historic cars. And back then, they actually had the more futuristic cars. I think for GM, they had one called the Jupiter II or something like that um, on display. And then after, you know, the second six month, a uh, third three month run, they actually you know swapped out the cars. Uh, this one here is from a, a small slim line photo from Bell Telephone. Um, kind of like what the, the New York World's Fair, they were promoting a video telephone, which is kind of what we're doing today. Um, but they said by the 90s, we would have that. And they were a couple of decades uh, late. And in the foreground, you can see the mo mini monorail track and one of the cars um, just coming into frame. And just like with the National Pavilions, here's a handful of uh, corporate brochures I, I kept or I acquired over the years. This was from the Industrial Business Machine. Like I said, they had um, two pavilions. One was IBM Durango, which we actually had to Jacquard Loom. And from what I understand, of IBM Lakeside, they had partially set up to where folks could use telecommunication 
to talk to folks at a pavilion at Man and His World site there in Montreal. So that it really amazed a lot of people. Hey, you could talk to people not only from down the street or from somewhere in the city, but you know, in another in another nation. And here we actually have a brochure from uh, Eastman Kodak. They actually had a few signs scattered throughout the site. I don't know if you, most of you remember Kodak moments. Um, they actually had a few signs scattered throughout the site where you could actually, this is, this is the optimal photo spot. Obviously they have one for the Tower of the Americas and a few others, but yeah, I read that in, a, in the internal business brochures. Yeah, there's actually a few spots. I thought that was very cool. Um, this one is Humble Oil. Uh, it was, this one was actually housed in an existing building built in the 1890s. Uh, Humble Oil, I believe, eventually went on to become part of Exxon Mobil. And then here we have the uh, brochure, which actually shows, again, the neat mid-century modern styling of the uh, GE Pavilion, uh, which is located on the far north side of the, uh, of the expo site. Let's see. Next uh, set I have for you would be a series of press images. This one is actually of a group of entertainers. They were called the Potpourri Players. And you can see them in front of the iconic uh, US Pavilion Confluence Theater. Uh, but their functions were to go around the site and entertain the folks that were you know, stuck in long lines. And they would just do pop-ups of uh, uh, various scenes from different Shakespearean plays. Um, so I, I, I had a note, I think I said on the back of this image what this scene was, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, let's see. This one is actually um, one of the three food plazas we had at Hemisphere, in which case we actually had, uh, you see the canopies that soared over the general seating area so people wouldn't bake in the South Texas sun. And they also had um, air conditioning units that were also suspended. So that way it would at least be a tolerable breeze by the time we got to them below. Um, and this, again, here, this is where we had a lot of restaurant tours, some that came from uh, Expo 67 to participate along with some of our, our local restaurants. Let's see, and these are more quoted from slides I've acquired over the years. This one is actually of uh, the uh, Las Bodadoras uh, uh, venue, which was sponsored by Pepsi Cola Frito-Lay. Um, I believe they were also on site for New York 64, but I don't know about 62. But, you know, they were one of the more popular shows here where they actually had a, a pole. I was like, I forgot how many dozens of feet up in the air. They would climb up those ropes and they would dance and swing around. And it, it was a very popular show. It was open, an outdoor open air show. And the top, that pole was so high, you could actually see it with relative clarity from the Tower of the Americas. This one is of the uh, ski show. There was actually a small lake that was created as part, as part of the Lagoon Cruise, but it was a small lake, I forget, like eight or nine acres. This was actually done by the Tommy Bartlett group out of Wisconsin Dells. And I do know they actually were participants in the 62 World's Fair as well. Um, you can see here, we can see a show in progress. You can see a monorail moving through the background. They actually had about uh, about four or five shows a day, I believe, for the 180-day uh, run of the World's Fair. Um, here we have a, a press, uh, an image of the uh, one of the many uh, ethnic restaurants, or you know, uh, national restaurants, excuse me, uh, Polynesian. And then you can see in the background, you can see the sign from the entrance to the uh, Los Bonadotas show. You can see the, the Frito-Lay sign in the background. Um, here's another image of one of the other many, many entertainment uh, pop-ups they had on site. This one was called the Rainbow Theater. It was a small van that went around the site, and they actually had different puppet shows, some for kids, some for adults. Um, the more popular one they had there was a puppet called the, the snake called Argyle. And basically, if you want to understand, he was, you know, talking to kids, you know, just random, you know, interacting, interacting with people. But sometimes he would, you uh, know, bust out into, you know, some dry humor. Hey, you with the, hey, you with the fedora, where did you buy that, a yard sale? Wow, why would you get that, you know? Kind, kind of this like randomness out of there, but it was very popular from what I understand. And they had it, it would just drive around from the site from different spots uh, throughout the run. And in the background, you can partially make out the, uh, the pavilion entrance for uh, Bolivia. 
Um, these two images I'm going to show now, this one here, this is the uh, William Cameron Fountain. It was one of the many fountains on site. A lot of people refer to this as the uh, Sputnik type fountain. Um, it was actually commissioned by a local family, and they actually commissioned the two, one of the two murals I'll show you later. Um, and then this other image is of another fountain. This one is actually within the U.S. Pavilion Complex. It was uh, created by Trinity University art professor Bill Bristow, and it showed a series of 60-some-odd birds. They would take off and then fly. The original uh, concept for this was just 50 birds, one for each of the 50 U.S. states, where they would take off, they would fly, and then land, which is the, the natural um, behaviors of birds. But then because this was the, the, to uh, show the United States to the world, they said, okay, well, first of all, no, 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 the birds can't land. So, okay, so they kind of take off and then they just kind of fly and, and hover and then there you go. Um, then it, the number changed. At first it was 55 because they said, okay, well, we got to include the five U.S. territories. Okay, so they had to make five more. And then they said, well, okay, before we finalize this thing, we need five more birds for uh, uh, five prominent uh, military leaders. Okay, <laughs> so the final number was 60. Um, after the fair closed, the GSA took over the property and they unfortunately took all the birds out at one point and they just, they didn't actually take out the fountain. It's actually all still there. Maybe the pumps are gone, but the rest of the fountain is still there, all the piping and all that. And they just filled it in with plants. Um, if what I understand, there's about 20 to 30 of these birds still around in the basement of the federal courthouse. Uh, here are two images from the uh, 4th of July of 1968. Uh, we did have uh, President Lyndon uh, Johnson on hand from that. This is him giving a, an official, his official speech from the United States Pavilion. Um, I understand the, this unique photo came from a gentleman who was part of the architectural planning office for San Antonio Affairs. So that's why he was able to get back close to the president. Um, and after the afterwards, they did a tour of the site. Uh, visiting many of the uh, attractions before returning home later that afternoon. Uh, this one here is a three of the VIP tour hostesses. The lady on the far right is Robin Raquet, who I introduced to you to earlier. Um, this is one of her images uh, from them celebrating the 4th of July. Um, the next couple of images are just a, uh, various souvenirs I've acquired over the years. Like I said, this one is a Jim Beam decanter. This is the very first item I acquired, like I said earlier. Uh, when I acquired this, it was, it was never with the intent of amassing a, a private collection, which is over 2,500 items today, a website, social media extensions, <laughs> and, and the pleasure of meeting people from around the, the city. Um, that were involved in that. Like at this time, I was like, oh, I think that looks nice. I'll put that on my shelf. Um, but anyway, one thing leads to another. Um, this is another neat find I had at a local flea market, and I didn't know about this until I actually found it. It was actually an official board game. Um, I've taken a look at the instruction. It's kind of like sorry as far as the, the way that the game was laid out and, and the rules for it. Um, and I never got around to actually playing it because I know some of the plastic pieces are very brittle, so I just kind of keep it in the archival box and I'm afraid to touch it, <laughs> I'll probably break it. But that, I thought that was a, a fun find. And then this here is one of the many uh, glasses they had. I think it's called a Tom Holman glass, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but yeah, it's one of the many that, you know, souvenirs that folks could buy when visiting the site. And of course, we have the commemorative uh, plateware. This one here is actually one of the few coins that were minted for the fair, and literally this took an act of Congress to do. These, these were done by the, the Mint in Philadelphia after a Congress, congressional legislation was passed. They minted this in a bronze coin and a silver coin as well. Um, I don't have it for you today in the, in the presentation, but there was also an official postal stamp that was also uh, commissioned through congressional legislation and was designed by the image, uh, the Postal Office of uh, Imaging and Engraving. And it had a, a value of six cents. And from what I understand, it actually is still valid today. Not that I would ever dare break a book of stamps to mail my mortgage payment off, but I could if I have, you know, whatever, I think it's like 50 some odd cents today. So I'd have to, you know, add up for that, but it actually is still official postage. 
So that's kind of the neat thing about some of the some of these souvenirs of the fair were actually backed by the U.S. government. Speaking of that, uh, we also had a lot of visitors to the World's Fair that year. Not only just it comes at the fair, but also because it was a presidential election year. Uh, people coming through to announce their candidacy to promote their candidacy uh, for for um, the upcoming election of November 1968. Um, here we have an image of then Vice President Hubert H. Humphrey, who was seeking eventually uh, acquire the Democratic uh, ticket to run against uh, Nixon. So here he is at the United States Pavilion giving a, giving a speech. Um, here we also have the gentleman with the glasses is Senator John, uh, Senator Barry Goldwater from Arizona, and he's being shown around Hemisphere by the other gentleman, which is uh, I believe the junior senator from Texas, John Tower. Um, and actually, there was actually one day at the US Pavilion where they actually invited him for an official event. And uh, for the national day for that day at Hemisphere was uh, John Tower Day. And with most World's Fairs, we also had a lot of great uh, Hollywood celebrities and you know, VIP dignitaries that came from around the world. Uh, the two images I wanted to share with you, this one is actually uh, Prince Renier and Princess Grace of Monaco, um, who came to the fair in September of 68 for Fashion Week. Um, here, this is an image of, of them on a private uh, barge going down the San Antonio River. This other one I wanted to share with you is the gentleman there with the glasses is Jack Benny. He actually did a, a, a a one night tour at the Hemisphere Theater. Here he is, he's being shown around the press offices by one of the, one of the many uh, staff members. Uh, I believe we also had the, the Osmonds, uh, Bob Hope, uh, Jimmy Dean, long before he started selling sausages, uh, Balshoy, Balloy, uh, Ballet, excuse me, um, the uh, Mormon Tabernacle Choir came to perform as well. And uh, her, the uh, popular entertainer, um, Herb Albert, came with both of his groups, the uh, Tijuana Brass and the Baja Marimba Band. And unfortunately, with all great world's fairs, we had to come to a close. So on, uh, six months later, on the 6th of October, which was the Sunday, 1968, we had to bid farewell to the world and thank them for coming to join us in our celebration of our city's founding. Um, kind of like Cinderella in a way, at stroke of midnight, the fair closed, and all the sleep, all the property and structures reverted back to the city of San Antonio. Uh, what you're seeing in this image here is the gentleman on the darker glasses, that's um, Marshall Steves, who replaced um, William Sinkin as a president of the San Antonio Fair Corporation. And again, the other gentleman with the glasses is Mayor Walter McAllister. So this is kind of a little official uh, transitioning. So, okay, here we go, Mr. Mayor. We are officially closed. We just closed this last gate, as you can see. Here are the keys and um, shaking the hands, and we'll see you in the morning and, and sign the papers. Um, and at that point, it also dissolved the uh, San Antonio Fair Incorporated and its subsidiaries, which actually were created to put on the World's Fair from the, uh, from the beginning. Um, this is actually one of the many newspaper uh, sections I have. This one's from the San Antonio Light. I also have some from the San Antonio Express News uh, where it talks about the last day. After the fair closed, there were a lot of ideas tossed around. They actually came up with, they tried to reopen the site, the city did, about a week later to call it Fiesta Land. But one of the problems they ran into was the fact that there really wasn't as much coordination as there should have been between the city of San Antonio and San Antonio Fair. So when the city folks came in, one of the first problems they had is like, okay, what are the circuit breakers for the tower? We know they're over here, but somebody says that there's a breaker box on the other side too. So there was like little coordination. So there were many ideas that were tossed around a beach. Um, originally it was the exit strategy was to, put the University of Texas at San Antonio on that site. Um, and that's why like the women's pavilion was built as a permanent structure, all the few others to be, okay, after the fair closed, they would be uh, support structures for this new branch of the University of Texas. Um, but that idea fell through when a uh, construction magnet uh, donated 600 acres on the north side of San Antonio, and that's where it eventually went. Um, so unfortunately, the, the 
after that, most people they, they don't want to invest any more money because they, you know, the city, the fair actually lost money. It actually lost about eight million dollars uh, when compared to I believe Seattle had like I forgot like ten million in profit in their coffers when they closed. Uh, um, so unfortunately, it was the uh, civil centers turned into a little walking park. So they did that off and on for about forty years. Um, in, so that's why in some cases it was just cheaper to leave buildings standing as opposed to trying to demolish them. So here are some of the um, buildings that are still on the site today that were just never demolished. Uh, this one, like I said, this is Eastman Kodak. Um, it's, from my understanding, it's relatively the same except for it's missing its little modular cube on top, which is behind that tree. Um, this we have here, like I said, this is the women's pavilion. Uh, this was actually designed as a permanent building to not be torn down. It actually, in a sense, killed two birds with one stone. First of all, the BIE had a requirement that a certain percentage of your buildings could not be demolished. They had to be, you know, for uh, uh, post-fair use. The uh, Federal Urban, Urban Renewal Agency also had the same requirement. So they said, okay, well, this will satisfy that. And this was actually intended to be the student union building for the new UT San Antonio, which never came about. Um, this here, this is the state of Texas pavilion, which actually also became part of uh, UT San Antonio. It's the Institute of Texan Cultures. Um, this along with the tower are the only two buildings built for the World's Fair that actually are more or less still running off their original mission. You walk into the Institute of Texan Cultures and it's still, the, the layout and the intent of the museum is still the same as it was when it was first built for the World's Fair. Uh, this is the, uh, it was originally known as the Convention Center Theater. It was named after Lila Cocker, our first mayor of San Antonio. Uh, and it's hard to see in the image, but you can see a mural above the glass wall, which is called Confluence of Civilizations in the Americas. It was one of two murals um, commissioned for the fair. Here we have the uh, iconic Tower of the Americas, which is our theme structure. And in the foreground, you have the United States Pavilion Confluence Theater, which uh, after the fair opened in 73 as the uh, federal courthouse for the sixth district of Texas, which was originally eventually named the John Wood Courthouse. And then this here, this is actually another street view or walkway view of the RCA Pavilion I, was, I mentioned earlier. Uh, today is currently used by the San Antonio Park Police as their offices. In about 2009, the city uh, the city leaders uh, started entertaining the idea. So, what could we do for the site? It's very it's been a sleepy park. You know, we don't get a lot of visitors there. Uh, we get some visitors to the tower, and even less visitors to the Texas Pavilion. Pavilion, because from the main entrances, it's in the far back, but not a 92 acre site. So they came up with the idea of what can we do with it? So in 2009, the city of San Antonio commissioned the creation or formation of the Hemisphere Park Area Redevelopment Corporation, which is just referred to as Hemisphere. Um, this is actually one of their original logos. This one's my favorite. They've since rebranded. It's, it's a very good brand. But I, 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 for me as a historical person, I kind of identify more with this because you see the tower in there. You see the squish, which is kind of reminiscent of the... Uh, circular design of the original uh, logo of the World's Fair. Um, since the formation, they've uh, eventually came up with three different phases for the new hemisphere. You have Yanaguana Garden in blue, which actually opened in October of 2015. Uh, above that, you have Civic Park, and they actually just received final city council approval to break ground. So the official groundbreaking for Civic Park, which will be held next week, Wednesday, uh, so for any of those listening in that are in the San Antonio area, uh, it might be fun to, to join that. It's going to be uh, January the 26th, I believe at 9.30 a.m. is where they're going to do the official ribbon cutting to break ground on that. Um, and then in brown or tan, you have phase three, which would be Tower Park. Um, that's currently slated for about 2028, I believe. And that would include the Tower of the Americas, uh, Kodak Pavilion, Women's Pavilion, the RCA Pavilion. And then by then, the federal courthouse will have moved out into new property, and that's in the land swap deal. So that's supposed to come back to San Antonio. Um, and lit, pun intended, the court, the jury is still out on whether or not that'll come to Hemisphere or not. Um, 
This photo is of uh, Andres Andujar. He's been the CEO of H Park since 2011. Uh, this was actually on the opening day of Yon Iguana. So we have a great time chatting about Hemisphere. We've done a handful of tours. We're actually doing another tour, a uh, walking tour on Saturday the 29th of January. So again, for anyone in the San Antonio area, please come uh, down and join us. Uh, just a quick run through the three different phases. Um, like I said, in relation to the fair site, this was in the Yon Iguana phase one is in the southwest corner about four and a half acres. It's a play park. It's got splash pads, uh, small eateries, which are all mom and pop, no industrial, just like coffee house, but it's not like a Starbucks coffee house um, in one of some of the original uh, homes. Like so, four and a half acres, uh, let's see, opened in 2015. The, before COVID, they actually had a lot of success with that. They actually had about an average about 1 million people per year coming to visit. So became one of the top places within the state of Texas to visit on top of the, the river walk, which is literally a block and a half from the park. This was the original rendering of Yan Iguana, and it's actually very uh, accurate on what was, final, what was uh, eventually uh, finalized. Uh, and since then, they've also added a 151 unit apartment complex, which they also called the 68. Uh, there's two parking structures on site now, one surface, one multi-level. Um, and as far as the revenues from the local restaurants and retail in the space, a uh, percentage of those revenues come back to Hemisphere uh, to fund maintenance and public programs. Um, now, Civic Park, which I said is going to break ground next week, Wednesday, uh, is located in the northwest corner of the site where the original convention center was. Uh, it's about 20 acres. They're going to split it up into two sections. And like I said, there we go, January 2022. This is a rendering from Market Street looking into uh, Civic Park, where you can see the new western edge of the convention center complex, which was also part of the fair original build, as later named after Congressman Henry B. Gonzalez, who I said earlier was the uh, one of the originators, uh, created the 20th century plan for the 20th Congressional District. And then phase three, which will be like I said, 2025 to 2028, before they, they begin in earnest, um, will be in the center of the site. And like I said, as far as the size, they're not sure yet, because we're not sure if the uh, US Pavilion site will be transitioned from the city after GSA uh, relinquishes the property. And all I really have at this point for that one was a public workshop they held uh, in late in early 2019, where basically you know they get local input. I say, like, okay, we we've got Yanaguana started. We're going to start on Civic Park. So one of the fun things they told us was that okay, um, pretend you're you're a parent of four or something like that, and you you would just uh, what would you want to see to make you want to spend all day at, at Hemisphere. Uh, whether it be, you know, some people got to play residents, some people got to play tourists, a few other people got to play, well, you're here for a business convention, but you got a few hours between meetings. Um, so that's that's all I've done so far to date on that, but I'm really excited for, I believe they're going to start gearing that up sometime in the near future for public input and uh, site design. Um, and then a little breakdown, on, again, on my website, I welcome everyone to uh, visit after this presentation. Um, in there, I do more of a breakdown on San Antonio Fair, design, uh, construction, all the various pavilions, uh, a lot, lot more of the memorabilia I've acquired over the years. Um, key buildings would be like the tower, the two Texan cultures, things like that, the uh, convention center. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I've had the pleasure of reaching out to folks that were part of the fair and visited the fair. So I meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, or you know, pre-COVID anyway, um, and record for an hour conversation, kind of like what we're having today. And then I would take that and type that up into a Q&A format, uh, mainly just so other people can, that their, that their stories can continue on and other people can you know, enjoy and learn from that. Um, and then I also talk about, I've been chronicling L redevelopment that's been going on since 2011. Um, and as far as the new hemisphere, you can reach them uh, through hemisphere.org. It talks about all the different plannings they've got going on, uh, what you can do at Yanaguana today, 
uh, for those of you that wish to make any type of you know donation, uh, you could also do that as well and then get on their mailing list to find out what's going on. And that's about all I have for you. And I, I thank you for your time. So I'm gonna find the button here and uh, send that, I guess unshare it. Uh, not sure how to do that. Right up at the top, there should be a red thing, stop share. Oh, yes, thank you, Bill, stop share. Okay, and there we go. So I believe that puts me back on the home screen. Great, well, thank you, I appreciate it. I, I found it, uh, I thought I knew well, a fair amount about Hemisphere, but I learned a few different things. And uh, I took a couple notes to chat with you about, but see, first of all, other people who have questions or <laughs> observations for you, Don? You muted, Don. There we go. More useful to have the microphone on. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. I don't think you covered this, but my internet connection went down for about a minute and a half, and so I might have missed it. Uh, when I first moved to Austin in 1980, uh, we went out to the San Antonio site, and there was still a, a whole lot of the original hemispheres there, including the monorail. Uh, and there was a derailed monorail. Mm -hmm. off of there and apparently they had you know they kept the monorail running and there was a rather nasty accident that shut the thing down uh do you know when they finally pulled the monorail off the site and what the background uh, that would have been in the mid 1980s uh they actually had an accident during the last month of the fair operation mm -hmm. um where one monorail two mon one monorail backed into the other oh, and yeah. both of them derailed and actually one lady lost her life she was actually pinned underwater Mm -hmm. um that was an, e an interesting venture it was done by universal design limited they did one for us they also did one for the philadelphia zoo which actually was in operation until about five or ten years ago um and then in 69 they approached the city and said hey look we're trying to restructure our debt things like that we're on shaky ground would you mind changing our arrangement and the city said nope 50 50 down the middle for the next 10 years but then unfortunately uh, but within a year after that, so 1970, UDI went bankrupt. So the city was stuck with that. Um, and unfortunately, with a lot of the things about the site, after the fair closed, you know, all the energy was gone and people didn't want to invest any money. Even the, the city council, uh, the representative for, for District 1, which included Hemisphere, was trying to get ideas from the city to, to fund to redevelop the site and go through. Uh, so when you were there in 1980, yeah, they, at that point, they kind of kept it as a, as, as a site because it was just cheaper to say, oh, leave it alone, open it on weekends, create this little walkway so people can get to the tower. So it wasn't in earnest until the late 1980s when the whole site was actually reopened. They took down the elevated walkway system, uh, a few other buildings like the Bell Telephone Pavilion, Pearl Brewing. Um, they actually moved uh, the OK Bar at that, around that time or a little after that which was a, a, a Swiss pastry shop, and it's now moved out because they had to extend the convention center. Um, but yeah, so it was, it was probably about the mid-1980s. Like so back then, it was like, ah, leave it alone, or like fountains. They said, I'll just put some dirt in it. it it's the cheapest thing to do. Um, it was actually part of the Lagoon Cruise in the northwest, the southeast corner of the site. They actually, that's what they did. So I was actually, you know, got my shoe and a little shovel and I actually scraped out, I actually found the outline for about a, an eighth of a mile of the Lagoon Cruise. It was all still there. Huh. that's cool. Uh, you mentioned, I'm sorry. I just want to mention on the um, monorail crash, it was interesting because they had the same system basically at Expo 67. Mm -hmm. and Expo 67 had made it a uh, computerized monorail, no human action. But for mm -hmm. Hemisphere, somebody decided, no, we can't do that. We need to have a human uh, riding it. And the reports of the time said the crash happened because the guy in the second monorail that hit the first one was ostensibly reading a comic book and didn't look mm -hmm. up in time and smacked into the other one. And I have pictures of the derailment and the wreckage and yeah. the rest of it. But sometimes uh, computers can be safer than people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was surprised. Go ahead. I, I, I was surprised that they left the wreckage there for so long because, I mean, as I recall, I saw something dangling from those tracks. It may have been later they were sticking it off or something, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't know if they ran it after the fair close. Yeah, well, the other question I had was oh, sorry, hold on. Let me hang up on this person. So I'm scared. Yeah, that could have been uh, an okay. important call about your car warranty. 
Yeah, yeah, I know. I, 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 it's going to go out of date any time. I'll have to renew it. Uh, the women's building, the other right there next to the Kodak building. I went out there a couple of years ago just to get some photos. And the women's building, uh, it surprised me. Nobody seems to be using it right now. It, it's such a fascinating structure with all those handprints in the mm-hmm. side from all the women who built it. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, but is, is it, it, you're telling me it's protected. It's not going to be torn down, even if they're not using it. Is that correct? Or? Correct. Um, after the fair, it took uh, ownership, I believe, was uh, eventually taken over by the U- University of Texas. And for many years, they used it for storage. Um, I don't know if you remember, there's a, one section is a recessed opening. And it's like a roll-up door now. Where originally, mm-hmm. it was two ornate wooden doors. Um, and they took that and put a roll-up door. So they can you just drive forklifts in there. Um, and side story is that the women's pavilion is actually what got this whole redevelopment started. It was originally started with them. They were trying to, in the late 90s, they were trying to revitalize the building uh, to reopen it, to uh, restart its original use is talking about women in society. Um, and the guidebook talks about how it says, uh, man may have conquered the, wo- the world, but it was women who civilized it. Huh. Um, and the neat thing is, like I said, that, that was a split level building. And the reason for designing in all those different levels was not for the women's pavilion, it was for its intended post use as a student union building for the proposed uh, UT San Antonio. Mm-hmm. That's a, it's a beautiful building. I, I mean, indoors, it's just really nice space. I'm, I'm surprised no one has tried to lay claim to it and use it. Yeah, so it, uh, after Hemisphere uh, got started, I believe the, the oversight went back to the city, and that's going to be included in, in the Tower Park for 2028. Ah, good. Cool. Well, thank you. A great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Baron, you had your hand up? Uh, I do. Uh, let me turn this on. Hey, everyone. Um, Hello, sir. Very nice presentation, Christopher. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Um, I want to ask you, how many times have you visited the tower since you've begun your quest of the of the of the uh, World's Fair? I'd say on average, I've been down to the site about once a month, less during COVID. But I'm I'm down there all all the time. I was there doing a I was participating in a marathon tour um, where I was a docent stop there in December. Like I said, in later this month, I've got a, a walking tour set up. But even when I'm not doing like a tour or something, I'm still down there uh, at an average about once a month, either to be in the tower or around the tower, you know, getting photographs or if I learn something, I go down and look at where that building was and try to research more about it. More, uh, more specifically, how many times to the tower itself? And, and once every and, three months. And, and let me, and let me, uh, emphasize on how intimately do you know the tower with regards to you know you know going in and out of it and the back Mm -hmm. rooms and the service facilities and things like that been on top of the roof and things like that how familiar are you with the tower i would say i'm more familiar than the average person is for sure uh like i said i've spoken with the i've had i've had some contact with the grandson of the general contractor. I had one meeting with a gentleman whose father was one of the original electrical contractors. Uh, I met the chief architect of the site, John Cricken, who says like, well, first of all, the site where we see the tower today is actually number eight on paper. We kept moving it around. He says, every time I move the tower, all my other architects are like, darn it, John, we had just finished designing all these buildings. Now we got to erase all that and, and move it again, move it 10 feet this way, eight feet right. this way. Um, and then, like I said, I've had the pleasure of speaking with uh, one or two architects. Uh, Boone Powell is one of them. He was one of the lead architects for the tower. Right. Um, so he had a lot of great insight on how they built it for four to quarter million dollars. What we see today is design re- uh, rendition number four. Um, Have you had the opportunity to look at those floor plans, those construction drawings for the I, tower? I've seen some of them over the years. When, when like Fort Paul and Carson would have them on display because it's part of their archives. Okay. Um, I know, for example, like uh, people have asked me, well, how tall is the thing? I said, well, if you go from ground level, the shaft is 605 feet, the roof is 622 feet, but then the top of the antenna mass gets you to 720. But that's just from the ground. You still got to go down. Right. It, it's a 2,100 ton counterweight offsetting the 640 ton top house. And then you got pylons, 60 pylons that go 55 feet down into the bell foot bottoms. The last yeah. 20 feet is in solid bedrock. 
So my guess is it's about 900 feet. You go from the, the bell-shaped bottom foundations to the top of the antenna mass. Yeah, well, something's got to keep it in the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and from swaying and tipping over. Uh, uh, do you yourself have a have a keen interest in the the overall aspect of the tower, or just a, a general interest in the tower? I mean, nobody has yet given you carte blanche to say run at will, go where you like. We don't care. No, they haven't done that. Okay. I'd love to. No, have done, yeah, because it's it's owned by the city of San Antonio, but it's actually managed and operated by Landry's uh, Seafood. They do a lot of entertainment contracts, so I've tried reaching out to them because I know. There's actually two observation towers, or observation decks, one on the main one and then one on the roof. Okay. But unfortunately, that closed to the public in 1970. Um, and then when I met with Boone Powell, he had a neat story where they actually had two prominent engineers from different universities. One engineer says, yeah, your circular design will be fine. So it'll, it'll be good. Um, they had about 70% of the drawing stuff, and they hadn't done the engineering yet. So the one person says, yeah, you'll be fine. The other guy says, no, you're not. It's not going to work. It's going to fail. So they kind of came up with a neat idea to test it. He's a, a, a hydrodynamic flow study. Basically, they went down to the south, south side of town, San Antonio River, and they had some people that you know made some shapes, plopped them in the water. They had some folks upstream with one or two bags of flour to where they actually, oh, they, yeah, you know, okay, you open up that one and start letting it out. And then some folks, the architects, and they stood there, watched the way the flower flowed around the shape. Okay. And they said that that gave them enough confidence uh, to say, to continue on, to get the rest of the drawings done and then present that to the engineering team, which did sign off on it. Okay. But yeah, I, I would love to be able to go up to the top and then walk all the way down through the shaft. I haven't been able to do that or go up to the main, uh, top roof level, or even into the maintenance level underneath the, the dining room turntable. Because every now and then I go up there and I'll eat, and you can hear somebody thumping around and say, "Oh yeah, it's just a maintenance guy, um, you know, doing some <laughs> doing some work, um, crawling around down underneath the dining room turntable." Well, then that gets to my second question: is that you don't really need to use your one dollar coupon from the booklet in order to go to the tower, or at least to see if they would accept it. Yeah, no, I don't think they will. And they'll probably look at it like, what the heck is this? Because they, you know, a lot of the, the, the young staff that work there, you know, they, 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 they're, they're not versed on that. You know, like I said, I, I look at it and I can go through everything I've told you. And that's actually just a portion of what I've learned okay. over the years on the tower. But yeah, I haven't had a chance yet to where to say, oh yeah, Chris, go ahead and put a hard hat on, just don't fall off. Okay. But they haven't done that yet. Well, not that I would want to use that $1 coupon. Oh, no. Even even to see, but I would think that if you were to take it and present it to some young kid and he goes and gets his manager and his manager looks at you and goes, where did you get this? You know, come on in here. And then if I were the manager, I'd say, carte blanche, run the place amok, you know, yeah. I'll the place. <laughs> just because you happen to have that coupon and because of your interest in, mm -hmm. in, in the world's fair and what you've been doing for it. But you know that's just dreaming is what it is so yeah. yeah no don't 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 spend your coupon it's kind of fun to think that somebody you know what is this coupon but uh my my more interest was how intimate are you or have you been now with the tower and you know do you have more interest in it or oh, yes just more of a general interest in the tower oh yes like i said and um yeah i've learned that the what the support building which was the uh Golf Insurance Pavilion, right next to the tower. Um, they were. Uh, it was that building was mainly just for support services. But Golf Insurance prided themselves on being the sole sole insurance provider for Hemisphere. Where I believe there were twenty to thirty other companies that did it sporadically throughout Expo 67 the year before. Um, I know that building is also the support building now for the tower. There was a little courtyard where they had some trees in there for the fair. That's where the backup generator is. Uh, for the tower, you know, so I, I do have an intimate uh, knowledge and passion to learn more about it, you know, and I'm obviously I'm, I'm happy, excited to know that I'll, I'll meet other people on the way. They, oh, yeah, yeah, my dad worked on this or yeah, I, I, I worked on that, you know, that, that's right. I had the pleasure of meeting people and learning more about it is through oral history. Well, very good. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Again, it was a nice presentation and thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. Sure, no problem. I still, by the way, have my discount t uh, ticket for the uh, uh, AMF monorail at the 64 fair, but it hasn't worked out. Uh, Tracy, <laughs> you had your hand up. 
Well, I, there's a couple yeah. others. So Tracy. Yes, just real quick. I just wanted to thank you. It was a great presentation. Thank and uh, I actually attended. I was 11 years old and uh -huh. um, just really enjoyed it. And I remember, you know, I have spotty memories of things of it, but how futuristic it seemed and riding mm -hmm. the monorail and riding in the Swiss cars and um, dangling feet in the in the fountains and so forth mm -hmm. got lost and uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> got sent to the visitor center but it's great I remember the adults uh, talking about it as it was being constructed and a lot of controversy about um, making people move there was a mm -hmm. lot of poor housing down there and they were kicking people out that didn't want to leave and didn't really have anywhere to go yeah and uh, there's a lot of controversy about that and I just barely I just remember thinking as a kid well gosh that doesn't seem fair to make what if somebody came and just said you have to move and you don't want to have anywhere to go it, and it, it just I remember that stuck in my head mm -hmm. and uh, then the tower itself that was a big place we went for um, like prom night it was it was the big thing to get reservations there and have dinner at on the tower for prom night Wonderful. Uh, anyway, wonderful memories. So I just want to put my two cents in here. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, they went through the same issue in uh, uh, Seattle, having to tear down all sorts of old houses and communities mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. I mean, a lot of World's Fair is they build them on old rail yards, but some of the cities, if you're going to build it, there's generally not a plot of land uh, just waiting to be there. So it's, it's it definitely is, uh, if you wanted to do it today, you'd probably have a hell of a time doing it. Yeah. yeah. One thing it did do, though, uh, prior to that, I remember the, the Riverwalk area and just the general downtown area was like taboo and horrible. Mm -hmm. And you can't go down there. You're going to get knived or, you know, mm -hmm. mugged. And it was just bad, bad, bad. And it totally revitalized it and changed the city. Yes. The, uh, the U.S. military, because we have a lot of uh, bases here in town, we still do today. And what I learned through a few other interviews that the military had an active standing order, no active duty personnel on river level out after sunset. It was for their safety. Um, but yeah, back then, uh, the river walk was just one or two restaurants and that was about it. It wasn't until after the fair closed that people started coming into downtown and business leaders started looking at the ideas like, well, people like these barges since they did a quarter mile extension for the river, from the river to the World's Fair. And um, so then I said, okay, well, we take the idea of taking them to the basements, dig them out and make restaurants and, and shops out of them. Um, and that's why uh, they didn't actually choose that 9243 acre site just for the Riverwalk. And they chose it mainly because it was close to downtown, close to the existing hotels in the new Hilton Palacio um, and near the Alamo. So the Riverwalk we see today was a pier after, uh, after the bought. They said, okay, we've got people coming in, let's, now she will be doing redeveloping the river walk. And now we see it today. Uh, it's one of the top tourist destinations in the, in the state, if not the top one. Um, our tourism industry, I think is like over, I forget how many billions of dollars we do a year in tourism. But then it all came from the World's Fair. Ron, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I don't know if this will work, but uh, I'll try it because I'm gonna use the camera. I don't have it on my computer, but this is the uh, postage ah. stamp for yes, hemisphere and it's having trouble focusing on it of course and getting some glare but you can see it it featured the uh, north america south america and then this kind of uh, swirling uh, point coming out of uh, san antonio mm -hmm. uh, and uh showing it's it's about the americas kind of thing i think was the concept there so yes sir yeah like i said that was actually uh created through an act of congress uh, through the U.S. Uh, Imaging and Engraving Office that does all the commemorative stamps even today. Yeah, um, well, it, they do that. They did that up through the point when the U.S. stopped sponsoring fairs. They did a stamp essentially for every fair. As a matter of fact, the very first commemorative stamps ever made by the United States were for the Columbian Exposition. And uh, and that that was, prior to that, always just been general postage stamps. You know, it either had Washington, right. Uh, Lincoln or, or Benjamin Franklin, and then there was a few other little th uh, images here and there, but but that was the first time they started commemorative stamps, and they, they supported all the fairs up until the point when the U.S. pulled out of the uh, International Fair Exposition. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Thanks, Barack. Miranda? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, too. It was a nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Hey, Christopher. Yeah, that was a great presentation. Uh, about the stamps, there's a popular error of that stamp where that white swirly thing is, is off center or something like that. Yeah. I've seen pictures of it. Not sure how rare it is, but I have seen pictures of it. Really? Yeah. And then um, I have a couple of questions. Actually, Hemisphere was the first World Fair that I attended. I was in high school at the time. We took a family vacation to Texas, essentially because my dad wanted to see the recently finished um, Astrodome. Ah. And, uh, you know, so we made the stop in uh, Austin, San Antonio, and Houston. Never made it to Dallas. But anyway, um, I have a couple of points I wrote down. One is I may have told you this, Christopher, before. A gal that I worked with, she retired years ago, was a mini rail driver mm -hmm. there. And I, um, I didn't know that. I had lunch with a group of uh, retired women probably about well, almost 10 years ago now. She mentioned it. She was in college at the time and said it was a great, great experience. Uh, she was not there for the accident that went into the lagoon, but she was there. there, there was one of the cars caught fire at one point. Like the, mm -hmm. Yeah, she was there for that. Oh, okay. So um, let me see here. Some of the early plans I've seen for the tower, if you, have, you probably have pictures of this on your website. I haven't looked at your website for several years. I haven't looked at it since you revamped it. Mm -hmm. uh, the Tower of the Americas it initially had like a inverted cone type uh, yes, roundhouse at the top. Yes, sir. The, the very first uh, rendition had the concrete, because uh, basically the shape is like a, like a sprocket, like a gear, but a, yeah, a, a yeah. sprocket. And so that flared all the way up. So you had the, the buttresses at the bottom, then it transitioned to the straight shaft, and then it transitioned back exactly. out. Exactly. Right. And that's, yeah, so what you're thinking of is, is design rendition number rendition number one. Uh, um, and then the, the budget just came in, the proposal just came in way too high. Because originally, from what I understand, that was supposed to be paid for by San Antonio Fair, but they always had financial challenges. So that eventually became a project for the city of San Antonio, where they had to do an additional uh, bond issue for that. Um, and so they were trying to, okay, well, we got to keep it below a certain amount. And so they had to kind of then they started scaling it back, put it back out. Number two, still a too high in price. Three, and then it said four is our final. Whatever this is, we're just going to have to go for it because we're out of time. And that's when number four came in uh, with a bid through two contractors, uh, Gerald Lida of San Antonio, and actually Lida's former boss, Alvin Lott from Houston. And they did a, a combined bid of about four to quarter million dollars. And so they're, they're the ones that actually built the tower, the convention center, and they did the physical uh, build work for the quarter mile extension of the San Antonio River. Okay, um, another thing you mentioned, you had the graphics manual. Um, I'm a nerd when it comes to graphics. Uh, have you got, any of you have ever seen the show The Middle? Not Malcolm in the Middle, but The Middle. <laughs> and uh, the youngest son belongs to the font club at, at school. Mm -hmm. That would have been me if there was such a thing when I went to high school. But uh, I was very impressed with the graphics at all of the fair, even as a teenager when we attended. Mm -hmm. um, I remember writing a letter asking for information. I've got it here somewhere. Came on, it was kind of a medium blue paper. And you mentioned about no errors in typing, but actually there was an error in typing. And they had, um, oh, what was that stuff you used to use, the white out? And you made a typing error. Oh, why not? But it was blue. It matched the paper perfectly. Ah. You really had to look for it. I was really fascinated with that. But anyway, and then um, the map of the fair, the official map is really, really impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably have it on your website, I would imagine. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, it's it's all done. You know, it, it's it's divine artist. But it, it's kind of like a dusk view of the grounds and just the lighting and the mm -hmm. shadows. And all. It's really, really impressive. One of my favorite yeah. uh, World's Fair maps to look at. It's in a book. Yeah, the one, yeah, the one you're thinking of, I think that's in the official map book and separate from yeah, the guide book. It has book. a cutout of the Tower of the Americas. Yeah, that's yeah, that's one of that little cutout where you can actually make your little paper. And right. I still find them today and they actually never used. Not that they, I dare make one. I'm like, no, I don't want yeah, to. Yeah, I never, I never but, cut mine up. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so there was actually, yeah, they had the official souvenir book. They had the official 
uh, map book. They had the official cookbook, which I've got a paperback and, uh -huh. and hardback copy of. Uh -huh. um, yeah, they, they did a, a series of official books that people could buy for various, you know, 50 cents here or a dollar there. Right. Um, even, even the Tower of the Americas had their own official guidebook. And I've only, I've only seen it twice. One where I went and bought it on eBay and one other time afterwards. I've never seen it since then. It's so about a 25 page okay, uh, yeah, book. I've never seen that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that I do have I'm some pictures of on my website. But yeah, whenever you have to, I haven't seen yeah, please do. Stuff. And it's the same address. So, um, I was surprised that none of the international modules survived. I always kind of thought maybe they were permanent and they would be used. Well, like you say, that's, if this university had ended up there as classrooms, mm -hmm. whatever, they had a permanent look about them. Right. Um, but obviously none of them did. No. Kind of sad. Yeah, a lot of those you know, those were designed by the Fair Corporation, right. and again, like I said, it was all since it was all done in a mid-century modern style yeah, yeah. of form following function. So that also included the materials that they used. The only one example of that building that's still on the site today was the one built for the Mexican Pavilion. Okay. Uh, it's now a Mexican Art Institute. So that building is actually the the, bare, the foundation and the I guess you want to say the bones are from the original Mexico Pavilion building. Okay. And it's been it's been re redone on the inside. They added a second level, a very low ceiling. But then they also added a small 50 seat auditorium on, on the western end of that building. But that's the only one um, that survived. Okay, that's sad. Yeah. The fact that they filled the canals and the lagoon is sad too. And took right. down the elevated walkways. That's all kind of sad. Yeah, because that's what they did was they, they had the lagoon crews because they wanted to kind of expand on the, the idea of the San Antonio River and the, and the barges, right. the, the river boats. Uh, and that's another reason why they designed the elevated walkway system, you may, you may remember. Uh, yeah. I think uh, Don probably remembers that as well, was because that way people could go, you know, walk over to the tower, which they called Fiesta Island. They can go up and walk over the lagoon crews. And the other neat feature of that design of the walkway system was so it would hide all the utilities so you wouldn't see all the transformers. And they actually uh, finished out some of those spaces underneath the walkway for shops. And I believe one of them was actually a, an official active branch of the US Post Office to where people could go to the fair, it's supposed to take these big old bags and stuff and carry them home. They could just put it in a box and mail it to the house. Oh yeah. Yeah, and then Fiesta <laughs> Island is kind of the amusement park. That's where all the the rise right. yeah. the and they actually still have one small bridge over by the coca-cola pavilion it's really it's a little metal bridge it's like one foot off it's like six inches off the ground it makes no sense unless yeah. you understand that that originally was a walkway over the lagoon cruise uh, so people can go from one side to the other after they took the boats out but yeah, yeah. you go there today and it, you know unless you know the history that little bridge six inches off the ground makes no sense it's kind of funny the one last question. Um, a couple of years ago, it seemed that they were going to tear the courthouse or U.S. pavilion down. Was that true? No. Well, it was part of the, the political uh, banter game going on because, like I said earlier, the GSA took over the property, um, but they've never been known for truly maintaining proper, property correctly. That's why. So nowadays, in, in those the stories you were reading, that's when they said, okay, don't ever go to that building. If you do, don't breathe the air because the HVAC system is falling apart. There's mold everywhere. And don't ever drink any water out of the fountains. <laughs> and if you wash your hands, be careful because all the lead pipings decay. Uh -huh. um, but I think at the time, originally that building was supposed to be a temporary building, the, the Confluence Theater. The original plan was to demolish it, build a new building on top of it, and use that as a federal courthouse. But then some folks say, yeah, but we want to, we want to do this as cost effective as we can. So we'll just put walls up and try to make corners and around building where we can. So there's actually four floors in there now. Um, but the, the drawback is for the fair, they designed it to where everybody would enter through the courtyard. And that's where the public enters today and all the attorneys. And then they would exit, for the fair, they would exit out the back. You would walk up this ramp. And incidentally, that's where my boss's brother was stationed for the gay 90s saloon. He actually had a little timetable. So whenever the U.S. show would exit, he'd be at his station hawking people in to buy, you know, overpriced beer and sandwiches. But that in, that exit is now the entrance for the judges and the folks on trial. So that, that's a heck of a time for, they, they, they can't show the same elevator, obviously, but there is only one. 
Uh, so that was kind of a banter. And so eventually it got to where the federal government uh, approved, I think, $135 million for the new building. Uh, and it should be, and they're finished with it. They're finished. They actually are moving support staff out of the U.S. Pavilion today in, into that one. So I think within the next six months, the transfer will be complete. Um, and that should go back to the city of San Antonio. Um, and then whether or not what they're going to do with it, if they're going to actually allow it to become part, part of Hemisphere, that's, like I said, the jury's still out on that. But as far as like, what well, we need to tear this down, that was more of the political banter in, in D.C. to say like, why we need the money now for this. Is it protected anyway as a landmark? Um, I know it's, it's over 50 years old, so it would be eligible for historical protections to the state of Texas because it's over 50 years old in the mid-century modern style. Um, but I know uh, there's a, it's, it's a very uh, well-received building. So I know if they ever talked about uh, demolishing it, there would be a lot of uh, backlash because I know they had that. Um, I don't know if you or maybe Don would remember, maybe not Don, because in, in 88, they put the iconic hemisphere arch at the Western entrance. And when uh, the new hemisphere took that down, because they actually restored that street to vehicular access, there was a lot of backlash uh, from residents because it, it, they so, it's so iconic part of hemisphere. So I kind of feel the same about the uh, U.S. Pavilion. That if they ever got down to that point, but I, I think that the hemisphere folks they've done a couple of feasibility studies for the building, uh, different ideas uh, to repurpose that. So I think you know, I, I'd be very shocked if, if it got ever got to the point. It's like now nah, demo it, but I, I don't think so. It's a beautiful building. It is. And also, I've been trying just one last thing I, on the yeah. uh, piece of understanding website. I think it was you that posted the article about somebody about Lady Bird Johnson and her dismay over the pavilion. Um, I, don't know I, did, I don't know if that was me or not. It was just like yesterday, the day before, I, and I can't get past the, um, you have to subscribe to whatever, whoever, you know, the newspaper that originally printed the article. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Bill got past that, he said. A couple of other people did, but I remember at the time that uh, Lady Bird did not like the film in the, in the Confluence Theater. She said it left no hope because it did concentrate on you know, uh, Johnson's thing was the war on poverty. And mm, so right. think a lot of the theme involved that uh, industrial pollution, that kind of stuff. It was a really impressive movie. The three small theaters kind of merged into one right. for the final presentation. Um, but I think that's what that article is probably about, is that she didn't care for that film. I, like mm -hmm. I, said, I can't read the yeah. articles. I don't want to subscribe to. The article was talking about the film. And one of the things I found an interesting takeaway was that the Library of Congress has a 70 millimeter print of the film, but they said they have no facilities to be able to show it or scan it. And it's, it's kind of remarkable to think that the Library of Congress couldn't show a 70 millimeter film or that they don't have the ability to digitize it and or just send it out to somebody that can. So it's nice yeah. how the film has survived, but yes. it's, it's hard to believe that it's still sitting there and unaccessible. Yeah, that's, you know, that's it, a shame. It started out in three separate theaters. Mm -hmm. And the movies, were each of the films, it was, I guess the, if I can remember correctly, the um, different cultures coming to Texas, mm -hmm. I think. Right. And, and they were probably like 35 millimeter size projections. Correct. And then when the curtains open and the theater merged into one, that's when you had a 70 millimeter. So I wonder how they would, uh, I'm sure they have a way to digitize it, you know. Right. Well, they, they, well, the whole thing was actually filmed in 70 millimeter. And then they just, they, they, they downscaled it to 35 for the first half. Well, it, first half, like you said, you would have three different theaters. But it was showing the uh, idea of America as the great melting pot. So that's why you go into those three different theaters and then halfway through the show, you hear the, the roar of engines and the Saturn V for the, the Apollo missions. I know we had Apollo 6, 7, and 8 for the year of 1968. Um, and, but you wouldn't hear the 35 millimeters powering down, the curtains rising, and the two 70 millimeters powering up. And all of a sudden, so you would just have this, this blackness with roaring engines for about, I don't know, about 15 to 30 seconds, somewhere right. in there. Right whatever that time sequence was. And then all of a sudden you get this big bright light and all of a sudden we see this IMAX uh, style screen for the, uh, the second half. Yeah, it's hopefully someday someone will bring it back. 
Mm -hmm. I, I also wanted to, I had a comment for you. Uh, it was interesting when you were doing the uh, bit about the uh, hotel and the modular construction. I had not realized that they had done that. I, I always knew they used that uh, philosophy for uh, the contemporary resort and the Polynesian at uh, mm -hmm. Walt Disney World. Uh, you know, Hemisphere, I'm sorry, uh, Expo 67 was a little bit different that they were all, you know, built and then uh, stacked on top of each other. Mm -hmm. But the hotel, uh, just like the Disney hotels, was a modular steel frame with drawer, rooms that you slid into it like a filing cabinet drawer. So I had already, oh, I had always thought there was something U.S. Steel and Disney came up with, and yet there it is, uh, you know, three years earlier being uh, being done in San Antonio. So learn something new every day. Yeah, and the new thing about that hotel, like I said, it was at uh, H.P. Zachary, who was the the founder and CEO of Zachary Construction. So he was also the chairman of the San Antonio Fair Executive Committee. So it was kind of said that he issued and accepted his own challenge. Um, and I'm like you were talking about a steel structure for the contemporary resort. Uh, these are actually just, you know, one like Legos. They're actually just stacked one on top of the other and they're just bolted down. Okay. Um, the neat thing is when they put them into place, they would drive them. There was five different styles for the 500 room modules and they were completely finished out on the south side of town down to all the carpeting, the toiletries, Gideon Bibles and the drawers, the TVs, the lamps, everything. And all they did was they took it, they hoisted it up into place, connected all the utilities, secured the module to its, its counterpart either next to it or down below it. There was about a uh, one foot space between the modules for all the utilities. And then they finish one and they bring up the next one. I think at a, at a, at a record pace, they did about 30 some odd rooms per day. Yeah. That's, that's very impressive, uh, very much. Brent, you had your hand up? Yes, I was intrigued by that uh, bit about the Jacquard loom at the IBM pavilion. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows what the Jacquard loom is, but it was the origin of the punch cards that would have been used for computer programming at the time of Hemisphere. Okay. Uh, the technology, I, I double checked the dates on Wikipedia as you were talking about it. The Jacquard loom itself was invented in 1804 based on technology from the 1700s. And they did, they had programming with punch cards and they would put up a chain of punch cards that would be read into the loom and that would control the weaving. And they had mm -hmm. instruction manuals, they had books that people would get and plan out how it would work. Um, I'm very curious about it, one, because it is a very interesting idea. I uh, wondered if you had more information on that IBM pavilion, because I sometimes give talks uh, at local science fiction conventions on things like the history of technology. Mm -hmm. A fascinating area of the history of technology. By the way, if you remember the old Connections series with James Burke on PBS, one of the episodes of that series includes the Jacquard loom mm -hmm. and traces the development of the punch cards. They were used by the U.S. Census as a way of recording data for all the people. And then if you had questions, you could you know, like how many men over the age of 30 are living in Kansas? Mm -hmm. Stack of cards for Kansas, set up your patch cards and just run them through and come up with the answer. And that's where IBM got the idea to use the punch cards for programming, which is what everybody used for programming mm -hmm. until the modern era when we just type directly into computers and computers are something that we just put in our pockets and carry around with us. Here's a uh, copy of the loom. Uh, can everybody see the picture? Um, not, no. not yet. I'm having a problem. Zoom is uh, bombing on me. So let me uh, get. He's back. 
I don't know what's wrong with. Uh, I I have to rebuild my computer. I think it's uh, having some problems with uh, displaying stuff in Zoom. But uh, I have pictures of the uh, the loom and the uh, the control system for it. So uh, I I thought maybe for next week I'd go into uh, follow on what Christopher did and show some more uh, pictures of Hemisphere if people are interested in a, a part two for next week. Assuming I can get my computer fixed. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the Walters Art Museum in uh, Baltimore had an exhibit on the Jacquard Loom a while back. I took pictures of everything that was there. One of the most fascinating was they had a book with a page about this size, and it was covered with text, and the text was about, oh, size 10 font that we would use today. And it was all done, that entire page of text was done on the Jacquard Loom programmed on punch cards. So, amazing what they could do. There we go. I think I found the image Bill was looking for. No, I've actually got a closer up of the uh, the Loom itself. And uh, I want oh, to try to bring it up again because, yeah, it's a really nice right. shot somebody has. But uh, I don't want to blow, pick it up and blow Zoom out again. So, uh, mm -hmm. I think I'm going to be spending this week rebuilding Windows. Joy. Oh, it's a joy. You know, Windows is easy. It's the 2000 applications and all the modifications and license keys and all the rest of it. So maybe I'll just buy a Mac. I don't know. Yeah, Bill, <laughs> maybe your uh, computer has been sabotaged. It is a term that came from throwing a wooden shoe into the automated yeah. machinery. It's a sabot, yeah. No, I think my computer, unfortunately, was billetaged. I was trying to upgrade something for Billet. video editing, and I think I screwed up a uh, something in the video drivers on the system. So I'm going to try to fix it before I rebuild it. But yeah. Uh, anybody else? Questions, th thoughts? Again, I, I, Hemisphere is a, a great little pair. We didn't know much about it at all uh, back east. Uh, you had 64 World's Fair, 65, you know, took all those dollars. We had Hemis, I'm sorry, uh, Expo 67, but they didn't do an awful lot of uh, advertising. You had the uh, uh, insert that you did for the, uh, uh, the New York Times, but there wasn't an awful lot of talk about let's go out to Texas and, and go see it. Uh, so I had a brother who lived in San Antonio for a while, and he didn't know much about it because it was in the years after. So Chris gave us a really nice uh, tour of the fairgrounds, and we had a, a, a great time walking around. And uh, unlike some other cities where there's no sign of the Old World's Fair, uh, San Antonio is really great. So I, I recommend to people, if you're going down there, you know, besides just visiting uh, uh, Riverwalk, uh, go over and visit the fairgrounds, and there's some great signage. What was the pavilion we looked at, Christopher, that was basically totally empty? Was that Kodak that uh, we, we picked right. up windows? Yeah. Yeah, Kodak in the women's pavilion right next to it. Right. So, uh, yeah, but it was for World's Fair Nerd. It's a, it's a must-do. You, you got to go and visit it. Yeah. So, I mean, um, a lot of people may or may not know, um, uh, Don might know, is that... Um, Anybody ever stay at a La Quinta Inn and Suites throughout mm -hmm. their life or, or know of that hotel chain? That actually was a Hemisphere original. Um, like I said, before the fair, we had some hotels, but we didn't have anywhere near the, the lodging capacity for 7 million people within a six-month run. Uh, so that's why they built the hotel like the Hilton Palacio del Rio. And another one was uh, La Quinta Inn. Back then, it was uh, La Quinta Motor Inn. And the very first one was located on Commerce Street, Street, one block north of the fair site, and it opened on April the 6th, 1968. Um, and they were actually a privately owned and privately managed company until they bought, were bought out or merged into Wyndham Hotels in, uh, I think it was 2017. At the time of the merging, they had about 853 properties varying, ranging in uh, direct own and manage and franchisee. But that actually, started as from uh, Sam and Phil Barshop through their lodging company, uh, Barshop uh, Lodging Enterprises, um, as a way to, to get in on the, on the lodging, expand their lodging empire. So that was the origins uh, of La Quinta Inn & Suite was to accommodate visitors to the San Antonio World's Fair. 
Yeah, I'm looking at the chat here of all the people talking about all the ancient uh, 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 computer languages and hardware and all the rest of it. We're all going to date ourselves. <laughs> we don't miss punch cards. <laughs> oh, I, I remember with the punch cards, you'd have a whole big thing and you make a pattern down the top of them so that mm -hmm. if you dropped them, you could see that, oh, the stripe all of a sudden got broken up here. Here's why I need to put the cards back <laughs> into place. <laughs> And then the paper, paper tape, and the teletypes, and you know, yeah, things. Yeah, I, I told people I never really felt old. So one day I walked into a museum. Carol was with us. We were, went into a museum, and uh, it was the uh, Royal Navy Submarine Museum. And I walked in, and there was a computer I had designed on display in the museum. <laughs> I said, "Oh my god!" Oh my! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, you, you expect to go in and see a dinosaur or, you know, a terracotta warrior or something, but you walk in and go, oh, that was my paycheck for two years. And it's sitting there and all the kids are pushing the buttons on. I go, oh. it was so secret when I did it. I couldn't even tell my family what I did for a living. And now it's a tourist attraction. So life changes. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the RCA Pavilion, they, the, part of their exhibit for Hemisphere, they, they showcase the, uh, R, they might, uh, was it the RCA Spectrus? It was, uh, and they had some computer terminals for, for kids because they were trying to uh, promote the idea of uh, computer assisted instruction. Yeah. So they had these uh, kids and they were these big terminals, which are like this old IBM uh, electric typewriter with, with a ball on it, that size. And they're trying to, you know, use it to, to, to teach students. So that was the big thing they had at their pavilion for Hemisphere. I think, I forgot what the, Bit capacity was like five bits or something like that. I forgot what it was, but then at the time it was state of the art. Yeah, Disney's first mainframe was a Spectre 70 series and uh, it was at the studio in, in Burbank. And uh, it was uh, all the hotels and everything in Florida were run, uh, leased phone lines out, out to Burbank for the longest time. So uh, that was, uh, uh, I forget, we went from a Spectre 70, I forget what the next model they got was, but you watch the semi trucks drive up and mm -hmm. you know, forklifts and all the rest of it. <laughs> yeah, that was about it back then. That's where they, that's where they, that's where they got to try to get the bugs out because they were that size and these little bugs would get in and start eating the silicone or something. Oh, crazy. Just reading Ken Carpenter brought an entire computer hole by telling it to read from the line printer. <laughs> And the fun part about that, it was a, a seven, this was a high school group that went over to the local university once a week to get experience on the computer. And, you know, it was very beginning. So the program was like a seven line program that took in the uh, height and width of a triangle and computed the area and printed it out. And nobody could figure out what I had done. It's one of these machines where everything just stopped and there's a bunch of lights on a wall of, of displays and people had to go and write down which light was lit on each of these, you know, a hundred displays. And, you know, all these experts, you know, from the university were pouring over this program <laughs> and nobody can figure it out. So it was a matter of saying like read unit seven instead of five or vice oh. versa. <laughs> they nearly didn't let us back the next week, but after sufficient apologies, <laughs> they did. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna have a talk someday on the stupid computer tricks we've all done. <laughs> I could probably go on for hours. <laughs> Uh, Carolyn. Yeah, if you guys are interested and you're ever up in Seattle again, there's a museum up there called the Living Computer Museum that was funded by Paul Allen, I think, and a couple of other computer magnates. And they have computers going way back. And I actually ran across the first one we ever bought was an Osborne executive, and they actually had one working and they had it connected to a USB device. So you could bring your old discs that you're that your um, executive could read and they could actually read it and get the stuff onto a key for you if you wanted to recover all your Ooh. old programs. It's south of downtown and it's definitely worth visiting. It's got computers going back. I, I, got a, I mean, they have just all kinds of stuff in there. It's pretty cool. You know, talking about line printers, it made me think of my, my uncle. I I'd mentioned him in the past. He worked and did all the payphone systems for the 64 World's Fair in New York. But he got out of the, uh, the payphone and climbing up telephone business, and he ran the computer center for uh, the uh, AT&T stockholders. So I went to visit him over in New Jersey, and it was uh, around Christmas. And he said, hey, you have to see one of the things one of the programmers uh, developed. 
and he loaded up a program and it started printing on the big line printer, 120 column line printers with the little hammers. But it was printing a picture of Santa Claus and the reindeer. But the neatest thing about it was it was programmed to do it and play a Christmas carol at the same time. So you could recognize that as the hammers were going that it was playing a Christmas carol. When you were done, you would pull off the, uh, uh, you know, the sheet of paper. And I said, that must have taken a hell of a long time to, to program. And he goes, oh, yeah, but my boss loves it. And we bring all the executives in here and let them push the button and it prints Christmas carols. And it was, it was the neatest thing, just hearing this thing hammering out Christmas carols. <laughs> so, well, great. Uh, before we go, uh, Rob Bianco, if you're still on, Rob's going to be giving a talk. I think it's about two weeks about models. We had tried mentioning at the beginning, Rob, but you might have been muted. If you're still there and would just like to... Yeah. Uh, Say anything? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm here, Bill. Can you hear me? Yes, sure. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I don't know if you got that that the, the video uh, of the of the model that I made, Bill. We to kind of edit it a little bit. Yeah. Um. Okay. And then uh, next week I'll be sending some photos of some various uh, pavilion models that I made and. I think you're looking for me to share about the, the tech, the various techniques that I used uh, to make those models. And uh, also I've made some larger scale pavilion models that some people might be interested in. So, uh, but if, if there's something in particular you'd like for me to uh, talk about, um, you know, I'll be glad to do that. Right, I think we said that it was gonna be two weeks from today. Yes. Right, great. Yeah, yeah. Again, Ken uh, Ken Carpenter, I know, is a proud of owner of some model of uh, uh, Rob's models. Uh, I've got the New York State Pavilion. Uh, you know, uh, Carol, you had your hand up. Yeah, I got a, a direct message from Jim Brown. He probably thought he was messaging you to to say who is the guy you spoke about who worked with the New York Fair phone booths. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, okay. Get back to you in one second, Jim. Uh, so yeah, Rob uh, does great work and uh, really impressed by doing it. And uh, you know, if you have to own one of the models to really appreciate it. When you look down at the mm -hmm. itty bitty tiny little size of the people and the trees and all the rest of it. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the techniques and how you do it. And, and the big model that he's talking about, the one we'll edit the video, Dan Land, uh, is just, uh, just phenomenal. Somebody has one hell of a... Yeah, a great collection there. So hope uh, folks join us in uh, two weeks for that. Yeah, yeah these, these models are great, Bill. As you said, I've got the Ford Pavilion and the GE wow. uh, Carousel of Progress ones. And like you said, the detail is just mm -hmm. insane. You look down into the Ford Pavilion and you see the little tiny cars inside of the, the sweeping gangway on the outside edge and bushes and fountains and everything. Uh, just absolutely amazing. Um, I, I can't imagine what, you know, that, that Danland thing that you're going to uh, show in, in two weeks, Rob, you know, it's just astonishing to watch the video of and well, of course, secretly trying to figure out who the secret customer is and we all have our. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, unfortunately, I, I can't reveal that, but, um, but we do have the video. And of course, uh, you know, again, I don't know, Bill, how if you want me to go back to you know, the, my World's Fair days of how I got started in this yeah. whole thing in the first place. No, I, I think, think that would be fascinating to go back to uh, uh, to your 1964, 64 model. Oh, you got you got to do that, Rob. I mean, that that sets up. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, it was it was quite a story, uh, which, by the way, is uh, also posted on um, Bill Young's uh, website. Uh, which is where most people connect with me uh, that that have an interest in it. Um, and Bill, it's kind of interesting that the number of people who are interested in this and some people say, well, I'd like a, a model of the Wisconsin Pavilion because my mother worked there, you know, when, when uh, during the fair. So it's kind of things like that. Yeah, neat stuff. Great. Uh, Jim, you were asking about the uh, my uncle, uh, my uncle. They didn't have yet soup, but they had the chicken noodle. Oh, let me just uh, throw that back on mute there. Thanks. 
my uncle Bill had worked at the uh, uh, New York Telephone as a lineman, worked his way up through the years. And he was one of the ones that really got me interested in the fair because he was working at the fair site. And he had the, uh, uh, basically being the foreman of the crew that connected all the pay phones, but he also connected all the clocks for the uh, Swiss clock system out to the, you know, the 10 or so clocks that were scattered around the site. So we'd see him at Thanksgiving or something, and he'd talk about, oh, I can't believe the crazy stuff they're doing out there in Flushing Meadows and that. So he worked for uh, New York Telephone for years and then uh, got a chance to go into the corporate world and ran their, their data center. I forget what city it was, Holmdale or something, New Jersey, for a number of years for stockholder relations. Unfortunately, just passed away this uh, this past month. But oh, uh, sorry to hear that. Yeah, well, he had a, a good run, but uh, it was fascinating because, and he had, uh, like I said, made the transition from the guy climbing the pole in the sleet storm to sitting in a computerized room, and he was very happy to get indoors after 30 years of climbing poles and going down in manholes. <laughs> yeah, I was going to try to see if he had any. Um information or anything that could be of help to us in the restoration of the phone booth from the fair that we have it stored at the Queens Museum. Uh, we're mainly trying to look for the phones, three of the actual phones themselves, which I understand don't exist, but if there's anything close to it or, or a recreation could be built by somebody, we need we have the phone booth, but we don't have the phone. So it'd be great if we had a model builder or something who could build an exact, you know, as near exact reproduction of each of the three phones. No, I have a copy in the garage of the Bell System Practices that contained the details of most of the phones up through about 1970, about 69 or 70 when I got them, when I worked for uh, AT&T myself. I'll go into the garage and dig into the boxes and see if they have anything on any any of the that particular type of phone. They have phones that are so esoteric in there, it can't believe it. I'll, I'll see if I have anything there for you. Okay, that'd be great. Uh, if you have my phone number and information, uh, yeah. you already have it? Yeah, I, I got it. Okay, please get in touch with me. Thanks. Yeah, I'll try to do it th this week if I have time after rebuilding my computer. I'll, I'll go take a look. All right, thank you. Yeah. I know it's it's assuming, of course, Brown's... I haven't torn my hair out and gone crazy. <laughs> Sorry, Chris, was, go ahead. I was just going to say, I know the, the, the background that Mr. Brown has is actually an image from the monorail accident, uh, the third week of the fair, uh, before the fair closed in September. Yeah. And I, I know that a lot ago, so yeah, so that's a... That was the, the two cars that collided. So I'm, yeah, so the, the other story I heard was that you know, there was actually a tire failure on top of that comic book thing because those those tires were pressurized like a car, but they didn't have an inner tube in it. And so on top of that, when he was trying to hit the brakes, um, he couldn't stop it in time because one of the tires popped. And so I started getting on balance and he didn't have enough, enough traction. Actually, uh, I try to pop up a picture when I had one of my computer crashes of the car lying on its side, and the, the tires look pretty intact. So, uh, yeah, interesting. But yeah, next week I'll, I'll take us down uh, to Hemisphere Part Two, and uh, I have quite a few pictures of the uh, the crash and the aftermath, and uh, you know, uh, the mangled wreckage. It was really a, an unfortunate situation that it occurred. Mm -hmm. So I, the one woman was killed, and I think about eight others uh, hurt some sort of seriously. So you right. know, they dropped off that thing or having part of the monorail drop on top of you was not a, 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 a good event. No, but uh, we did have a lot of folks on uh, visiting the fair that day from Lackawanna Air Force Base, what I understand. So they jumped in right away and said, okay, you know, make, make room you know, for emergency vehicles, help with the... Uh, crowd control, keep everybody back for, you know, emergency services to do, to do what they needed. Uh, so I understand that was another, another big support um, from military folks visiting that day. Lucky we were there then. Yes. And so you said some interior shots, Jim. I have some interior shots of different exhibits. Uh, I've got a, a number of them of the uh, IBM uh, pavilion in per or pavilions in particular. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll see what we can come up with uh, for, for next week. And uh, I put one of the, I hold off on doing Hemisphere because I knew Chris uh, has just a wealth of knowledge. 
And again, uh, World's Fair uh, 68.info. Mm -hmm. So encourage people to go out and visit that. Randy, you had your hand up again? I meant to ask uh, Chris if he knows, did Japan have a model of Expo 70 in their pavilion? I, I vaguely remember that there might have been, but I don't know for sure. I didn't know if they had a model of it inside the pavilion, but I know they had brochures because they were next in line for with Osaka, which is interesting. That's it's going back to Osaka Con site for 2025. But yeah, they had brochures, and then also on the side we had a small theater. It was called the International Theater, and basically for one week uh, during the run, each nation would show uh, popular films in native language. Uh, and then the last weekend of the fair, it would have been October 5th and the 6th of 68, the, Japan had that theater again, and they actually ran a three-part series of, of a film previews for, uh, for the upcoming Expo 70. Oh, wow. okay. and next week, Carlos would like to see the elevators to the, the tower. So uh, I, I will come up with some pictures of the, uh, the, uh, the, the tower. By the way, one thing I uh, didn't mention on it was that uh, you were talking about differences between uh, Seattle's, uh, you know, Space Needle and the uh, the tower uh, in the Americas. Seattle's top was built up at the top, you know, mm -hmm. what I mean? and then uh, the hemisphere was built at the bottom and then raised up to the top. So uh, that had to be a massive job to build the, uh, the, the top house and, and get it all the way up there and bolt it into place. Right. What they don't tell you on the on the elevated right up is that they almost dropped it halfway up <laughs> because they because it's 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 designed kind of like an umbrella, so it's cantilevered. So all the all the main muscles up on the roof. So they did the roof, raised it, main observation deck, raised it, maintenance, then the lounge, then the dining room, uh, kitchen spaces, and then the turntable, and then raised it all the way up. And they were using uh, piping. And they had it, you know, stacked on, on mounts and little motors, you know, uh, about 21 days in January of 1968. And about halfway up at night, it was a cold winter night, high winds, and the winds happened across the resonance frequency of these rods. Kind of like that iconic video of that one bridge, I think in the Seattle area, where you see it, it just yeah. kind of sways and, and just tears itself apart. Well, we had that same problem. So all of a sudden, on one side, uh, six full, six shafts in series disconnected from the top house one one by one by one just pop 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 all of a sudden then the top house started to tilt and got itself stuck about halfway up so they had to rush and, and figure okay how do we re-engineer this real quick before the whole thing drops and crashes on us um, like those bells dinghies at the amusement ride and so they say okay let's change it out for less rigid oil piping and it's, it's more more uh, flexible. And so they, they did all that, they reset it, made, it, made the, the inner mesh corrections and then raised it up. They were trying to, the funny thing was that they were trying to panic and scramble to get cranes from all over the state to temper and hold this thing in place. The only crane they couldn't get was the one right down the street at the Hilton site. Because they asked Mr. Zach, can we buy your, your worthy bird crane because we need to hold this thing up. He says, I'd love to, but I, I've got to finish the hotel on time. I, I you know. Um, but yeah, so that's that's one interesting story. But yeah, like you said, with the Seattle, they actually built it, you know, in place. I don't know, was it like 180 ribs or something like that? One for every two degrees or something like yeah. that, I read. Um, but yeah, with ours, it was about 640 tons dead weight. They had all the, uh, the basic frame using Western steel, uh, was a carrier air conditioners and Otis elevators. And they, they had the air conditioners and the ele elevator mechanisms in the, in the frame before they raised it up. And um, it was on the 24th of January, 1968, where the top house reached the top. And uh, the city council had it there where it had all the air raid sirens, all the, it was a big news event. And I have one clipping where it talks about so our, our top house has risen to the occasion. It's a nice color photo from a helicopter uh, from that morning. Well, thank God they figured out how to fix it. <laughs> yeah. Chris, it, does, does the um, restaurant still revolve? It does. Um, the average is about an hour, but I did kind of learn that they can they can adjust that speed. So like on a slow weekday or something like that, they can slow it down. So you can make a whole rotation because human nature will say, okay, once you've gotten back to where you started, okay, we're done with the drinks, we can go back down. On um, I understand on busier nights, they will speed it up. So it goes a little bit faster so everybody can go around quickly and turn the tail around and get another diner in there. 
So they they can adjust that speed a little bit. And uh, do like you know a, does the, the space needle still rotate the restaurant or anybody know? Think, I think they took it out. Didn't they take it out, Bill? I think that the I think the space needle restaurant still rotates. I thought they took it out and it into observation. Yeah, I thought that when they did this recent renovation with the glass and all that, glass art thought I read that maybe they had taken that uh, revolving mechanism out, but I, I, I'm not at all sure. Dan Sherlock is nodding emphatically that the, it doesn't revolve. I'm that person. Yeah, unfortunately, they took out the rotation uh, oh, yeah, restaurant uh, during the yeah. Sad. That's too bad. I was just yeah. thinking you can make it a thrill ride, you know. I mean, you know, crank this sucker up, you know, do it at 120 RPM or something. Like that. Remember at, at Fun House, did you sit on that big? We called it the record. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In you all, you can see all the diners flying out the window. Yeah. Right. Just floor out. Yeah, you come around, they just throw your food at you. Yeah. So One of the things right. I remember during the fair was um, ladies would put their purse on the platform next to them. Oh, and, on the but that didn't frame. rotate. The floor rotated, but that platform. Yes. So, so that you know, their purse was gone. An hour later, they were back to their purse. <laughs> we had that at the uh, Bonaventure Hotel here in LA. They they built it and had a rotating thing, and you people would put the, like their purse down, and all of a sudden you'd be at the next table and say, "I got your purse over here," because it, <laughs> the ledge the ledge stays stays still. So, you know, put your drink down. Next thing you know, it's gone. Yeah, Whoa, yeah. Hey, look, a martini came automatically for me. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, thanks, Chris. It was really appreciated that you put this together, and I, I wish you well with your continued uh, collection and documentation of Hemisphere. And Thank uh, you. so glad to see the city has embraced the site and uh, mm -hmm. you know, doing stuff with it and not just abandon it. So uh, thanks for keeping the legacy alive. So thank you for the invitation to participate. No problem. We'll see you folks next week for Hemisphere uh, Part 2 then, and then two weeks for Rob's uh, model building uh, par excellence. Have a great one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.